We live? Yeah. We sure? Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jared Jones here at the Sacramento History Museum, bringing to you another Facebook Live of, of fashion. With this, our theme for March is uh, fashion. We're talking about fashion trends of the 19th century. Last week we were covering the Regency period. This week we're discussing the early Victorian period. My coworker Susan already discussed women's fashion with you today uh, on Monday. I'm supposed to talk about men's fashion and I don't know why I was decided as the person to discuss men's fashion because I'm probably the least fashionable person here in the museum, uh, my shoes case in point. Uh, but I want to briefly discuss what men's attire would have looked like at this time. And I really, when I mean this time, I mean 1820s to 1840s. And I really want to dive into where and how all these fabrics exploded during this time. So we got this wonderful illustration here uh, of the mid 19th century we have well-to-do individuals. We also have uh, servants on a ship, I believe, because this guy is wearing slops and I don't think you would be seen uh, anywhere not on a ship wearing pants like that. Uh, but you could see that there is some color at this time, but not a lot of different uh, printed fabrics. That starts to become in vogue uh, after what I discuss about the market revolution, which I'm going to cover during this program today. But we see uh, high-waisted pants. We see uh, broad falls. If you're wondering what broad falls are like, they are not your typical fly pants. The front flap comes down and there's two buttons here holding it together. There's no belt loops. They are actually held up by cotton webbing braces. There's, no, uh, there's not elastic in this, so these are not really suspenders. Uh, yet that comes about in the late 1850s. Uh, we have, uh, in regards to the well-to-do individual, his clothes are a bit more form-fitting because he could afford such nice things. He probably has multiple pairs of clothes. But everybody else, you see this gentleman, he's wearing a loose shirt like mine that I'm wearing here. And you're wearing loose clothing because you're working. And you wear the same thing every single day. And you definitely do not want to have something that's form-fitting that might get torn very easily. And there's no buttons. There's a lot of buttons on his coat and everything, but when it comes to the more common people, there's a button here on each sleeve to hold the sleeve closed, and you also have a button here at the top, but also you might not even have that button there, and you have your shirt tied with a scarf like I'm wearing. But that's because you had to remove your buttons in order to wash your clothes. So the least amount of buttons as possible, the better. And you typically always wore something on your head for sun protection. Uh, this would be in, uh, more of an inside cap. This would be a Miller's cap. But you'd have a more wide brim hat, either made out of straw or felt to protect you from the sun. There's obviously no sunscreen at this time. But let's talk about fashion in regards to common people at this time is by the 1840s you start to have people coming west to California uh, because of a lot of these events uh, that I'm going to talk about briefly as you have the expansion of cities in the north and you have the expansion of cotton in the south. So let's talk about some of these. And uh, when I talk about the market revolution, I'm talking about 1810, 1820, up through the 1840s. This is largely backed by textile industries. The market revolution starts to replace cottage industries where an individual would specialize on making uh, certain clothing items and they would make the whole thing in their shop. Uh, the market revolution changes everything where you have the invention of something that comes about in 1793 by Eli Whitney 
and that is the cotton gin. Because of the cotton gin, cotton started to be more affordable. And what I mean by affordable is that it started to expand the possibilities of growing that cotton. And cotton was grown in the South. And because of the expansion of cotton, you also unfortunately have the expansion of slavery across the South. And you have the expansion of more and more enslaved Africans being brought to the United States to work in these plantations. Well, this is the expansion of cotton over time, and this is pretty much because of the, of the cotton gin. You have uh, mainly cotton was grown on the coast. Uh, before this, uh, cotton grown inland was not as large. It was a lot harder to manufacture, but with the cotton gin, which was used to easily pull the seeds from the cotton flower, it certainly made the, uh, the farming of cotton a lot more just heavily used across the South. And it's, it is truly unfortunate that that's the reason why clothing becomes a lot more elaborate at this time is because of unfortunately the expansion of slavery. Cotton from the South is starting to be exported to the North. We're in cities in the North they start to grow, and I mean really grow. This is New York in 1827. You start to have the immigration of individuals from Europe at this time. By the 1830s, there's an economic depression in Europe, causing hundreds of men to leave Europe and go to the United States looking for better opportunities, not only for themselves, but for their family. You have a lot of these cottage industries are going under and with the replacing of these large factories in big cities like New York and Boston and Lowell, Massachusetts, where they started to have these large looms making these textiles. Here's another illustration. This is 1840 spinning cotton. Now, once you have the spun cotton, you can have these large machines making mass quantities of fabrics. Fabric starts to be more and more readily available, but out here in the West, it's still very expensive. But if you look on these, on these early machines, the market revolution, what is holding everything together? And how are these machines working so well. And that's where California comes into play. Because already at this time, in the 1830s, you have the rise of the rancho system. Now Mexico has gained its independence from Spain in the early 1820s. The mission system has fallen in 1834 and ranchos are starting to become uh, large. You have the Mexican government is dealing out large land grants to people on the coast. And the thing that everybody is raising are cattle. This is the rise of the hide and tallow trade. We're actually going to come over here to another illustration that we are. If those that are wondering, we are actually in our new exhibit, California in print, uh, items from the Eleanor McClatchy collection. So we have the hide and tallow trade here in California. In the late 1830s, you have at least 50 ranchos along the coast. Now here in the interior of California, John Sutter has uh, his fort two miles from where I'm standing at. And by 1846, 10,000 head of cattle. But why are they raising all these cattle and who is doing the job? A vaquero, otherwise known as a cowboy, is the backbone of the hide and tallow trade. Californios, were individuals uh, living here in California of mixed Spanish, Native, and African descent. But you also have, with these Californios, and especially the California, or the, especially the vaqueros that worked at Sutter's Fort, either through forms of coercion or bribery, whether they volunteered or not, the biggest population of 
of vaqueros here in California were in native, California Native American men from local villages. And they were the backbone of all, the whole process of the hide and tallow trade, where there's thousands of cattle at each rancho and about five or six are being slaughtered at Sutter's Fort a day. The cattle are being slaughtered, not only to feed the workers, but it's for the hides and tallow. The hide is the skin that there was, and these hides were being shipped out of here. This is an illustration from two years before the mass by Richard Henry Dana Jr. He uh, came in 1835 aboard the Pilgrim, and his book was published in 1840. It's the most, uh, I would say, the most documented personal account of an individual coming here to California during the hide and tallow trade. I highly recommend it. But these hides are being shipped out of here as there was a demand. Not only are they producing large quantities of boots in these factories in the cities like New York and Boston, but that's all those belts that are powering those early machines is those cow hides. That's belt, all those belts are connecting all those different parts of the machines. Now, what is also powering those machines to make sure it all works properly? You need a grease. That's what tallow was. Tallow not only used in the production of making soap and candles and a Tallow from California was probably the most popular thing in regards to soap internationally at this time. They could not get enough of tallow soap even in Hawaii at this point. But that's what powers these machines is the grease, uh, the rendered fat from, from cattle, and it is the cowhides that power these early machines in the market revolution and truly expands fabric at this time. And, but these, these fabrics are still very expensive here in California. In the 18 uh, early days of the gold rush, people that are here, their clothes are tattered. They were even repairing their clothes with bags of flour and stuff just because they could not get fabric in these areas. So while we talk about fashion, we're talking about people that could afford these types of things not the common people that are doing all these jobs. And so that is something to think about when we talk about fashion, is truly the origins of all, in all the different people that worked, whether it was good or bad, these people did these jobs that really advanced uh, the history and technology of this time, because the market revolution is the precursor to what becomes later the Industrial Revolution, and that is where you see clothing even expand even more, different colors, different patterns, and that kind of information I'm going to be covering next week when we talk about the late Victorian period. So thank you for joining me here today at the Sacramento History Museum as I talked about the early Victorian era, about the hide and tallow trade. I recommend uh, checking out our, ex our exhibit here when we reopen. We hope to reopen uh, sometime later this month. And uh, please uh, follow us here on Facebook and also follow us on our social, other social media channels, Twitter, uh, Instagram, TikTok, where we are the number one history museum in the world currently because I decided to film Howard in our print shop. Uh, thank you all and you have a great weekend. Bye everybody.